Welcome to Looking for the Ocean, where we talk about everything Pixar has ever made and what it means to us. I'm Danny. Everything. Vincent. Everything, everywhere, over the Sometimes course of a couple a of years. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, that, that's a better ending. Over many words. Well, no, you actually had a better thing written. And I'm Mark Young. Hello, everybody. And I'm welcome to this episode. And I'm that. Mark Young. And oh, that's right. I'm sorry. I think I <laughs> cut you off. I hate <laughs> that we do this entirely over Zoom, but it's the only way. So today we're talking about it's tough to be a bug, and we're talking about Leonardo. Danny, do you want to give us some background on these films? All right. So it's tough to be a bug. Follow up to hypothetically last week's episode. We'll see. Dun dun dun. Because yeah, we'll see. But. Yeah, hey. scheduling issues, but yeah, hopefully. Yes, Anyway, hopefully. tough to be a bug. So, this was the one in our big theme park document that we saw. Was, I was like, oh, yeah, this is just like a 3D short film. We can just do this as a short film. It's not like an improv show like The Laugh Floor or like The Turtle Taco Crush. This is a show, just a 3D, a 4D ride, sorry. That's what it's tough mm-hmm. to be a bug is. Leonardo, which I presume we'll talk about after it's tough to be a bug. I feel like that's what we normally do when we have an IP short and we have a original short. We'll do the IP short first. Anyway, Leonardo is a detour. Oh my god! And it's a detour. It's, yeah, it's from it's from Jim Capabianco, right? I got yes, that right. Yes, correct. Um, Jim he directed Your friend the rat. This is a yes. short film that I found very hard finding information on, but I do believe it is designed as a pitch short for a animated film because it ends with Leonardo. It's like Dune, where Dune surprisingly ends with Dune, dun dun dun, part one. And everyone's like, what? Part one? I thought this was just a movie. Well, um, actually, I read that according to Jim Capabianco's blog where he talks about making this film that it was originally just an experiment for him to see if he could do something kind of on his own, and it took him like 10 years to make. He has a whole oh, blog wow. dedicated to the making of the short film, so I ah, think cool. that it was later used maybe as like a proof of, I can do this to get their next, their, another film, The Inventor, off yeah, the we'll ground. Yeah, we'll definitely talk about The Inventor, is, I feel yeah, like. Yeah, that's his big independent film that he makes yeah. through the studio later on. And it comes out in 2022, I think. It came out in no, 2022. No, it's not out yet. It's not out yet. Oh. Uh, well, I, I'll talk about it. I actually did research on this movie. So, don't worry. I did research on the upcoming one, not the one that we're covering. Um, Great. But my point was, it ends with Leonardo dot 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 the beginning. <gasps> so. Oh, I thought that just was referring to him finding the Mona Lisa at the end. And then it was like, ooh, Maybe there's a next chapter where he does the Mona Lisa. I just thought it was like that, you know. Possibly. I don't think anyway, I don't think it's Dune Part One or anything like that. Anyway, a bug's life. It's tough to be a bug. A bug's life. We'll see if we talk about the other parks rides last week or next week, whenever we are. Yes, but this particular week we're talking about a short film that was released as an, an attraction for Bugs Life. And it came out in 1998. I th- before It came out before the film let's, was let's released. See. I, got the, I got the doc opened. Yes, it opened in... You're right, it opened in April 22nd, 1998. So it yeah, did they open. Had to That's kind of crazy. Time. This is an ad then. I didn't actually realize that. Cause yeah, and it, the ad, I don't know if they like updated it or something. I thought it looked amazing compared to what they like had I in think, Bugs Life. I think you are willing, not you, but I'm saying like the general audience is probably way more forgiving of bad visuals or animation in a thing like this. Because I do think like it's very vibrant, but you can also tell those character models have very little detail, but it's okay because it's a free attraction. Right? Like, I don't really... Well, I thought the I'm spider not... looked amazing. It had all that hair on it. And I thought that was pretty cool. Oh, okay. The spider in the movie. Sorry. I thought you were talking about the spider that falls on top of you. Oh, did you watch, like, a full theater experience yes. thing? Okay. Because well, no, there's, there's, had... there's one video on YouTube that just cuts to black for the theater experience part. I assume that's might be what you watch because that also has the big number at the end, just replaced with some like royalty-free music for some reason. 
<laughs> and oh, I watched yeah, that I one. Think that is the one that I watched. Okay, because I watched this that episode one... does come out before our theme park episode. We watch a lot of these through videos, except for the ones that Danny has personally experienced. Yes, so. and I was going to say, I have not experienced the original version of this ride, but I do distinctly remember going to Disney's California Adventure, and I always assume mid two. I, I assume I went in October 2002 always, because I know my parents, or April 2000, I know my parents took me out of school to go to Disneyland when I went to Disneyland, and I know... Well, this, would, this that, wasn't at California, was it? Yes, it was. I'm getting to that, Mark, but I'm, I want to explain ah. where, where I was, okay? Let me explain ah. my Disneyland trip. The reason just, I don't know... You might explain I, this in the episode. We don't know if it exists yet. Okay, but I'm talking about my experience with this ride, because I know I wrote this at okay. Disneyland, okay? I have traumatic memories of this ride. <laughs> That's my whole okay. point, is I can talk about just this ride today. Okay. And I'm making sure you understand now. Maybe you, uh, I understand whatever. now. I'm just... I'm always surprised that you're like one of the YouTubers that has personal experience with every single thing that they talk about. Well... And so I'm never prepared for, like... This Some of these rides that we'll the talk great about story of my whenever life. we did the other episode, that is different. But this mm-hmm. ride, I rode at Disney's California Adventure. I'm pretty sure I went in 2002 because the thing I remember was all my brothers got like shirts. And I've, I was, I don't know if we've ever talked about this before, but maybe it's something you just kind of know about me. It, for some reason, it took me a long time to wear shirts that didn't have cartoon characters on it. And then once I did change the shirts about cartoon characters, I wore like the same three shirts for about like four years of my life until my sophomore year of call high school, where I finally like, I was like, all right, I can start wearing clothes. It's just mm. a very weird thing that I was, I don't know what, what was up with me, but it was just I don't think that's a weird thing. I actually have read that it makes for, cause I read about how tall people should dress. I read that you should have something on the front of your shirt. So it draws the eye down. Mm, so that makes sense. you're, you're taller than several people. So that, was a fashionable move on your part well anyway my point being is that my brothers okay but it wasn't just that it was also like i had to choose what i wore right i didn't want to just wear whatever i was given so like the idea of being given like because okay my younger brothers got these shirts with disneyland on them um that like would change color when to like when they were more exposed to sun they'd like become colored right but to me, it was like, ew, blank white shirt. No, no, thank you. Get that away from me. And my parents rightfully realized this. So my present that I was given when we were going to Disney World to, like, surprise me was a Mike Wazowski keychain. <laughs> Which, in retrospect, is something where my parents were like, well, he doesn't want we're getting him from Disneyland, so we'll just give him Mike Wazowski. Which is like, okay, valid. But, yeah. My point is, that's why I assume it was in 2002. Because it would have been post-Monsters, Inc., so let's talk about stuff to be a you cherish that still. <laughs> I, wrote, I, I went uh, on this when I in 2002. I must have been eight or seven. I guess I was seven. It doesn't matter. I was a kid. It fucking freaked me out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this was a scary ride. Yeah, it seems like a scary ride. I assume they had the spider still. You had the spider still, which you can't tell in this. And I was trying to clock when it is. I guess it just has to be during like the scary part where like it all lights go out. There's a part of this where basically they start. I don't know how they do it. It's just like, you know, it's just like a pump of some kind. But I don't I don't want to sound too bad. But I feel like out of context could sound bad. But it's like they make it feel like your butt is just getting punched a bit. So it's like there are bugs crawling under your butt trying to escape from the bad guys. But it's just like, oh, ah! Because wow. that's, that's why if you watch the video of people screaming, the kids aren't just screaming because spiders are coming down. It's because I'm pretty sure at that exact same time, that's when it's like, it's pretty much punching your butt over and over again. <laughs> so if you're like, the hmm. bugs are crawling away, run away, run away from Hopper. And it's just like, very scary. So how much of the show is not what I watched, which was just the video animated by Pixar? Basically when Hopper shows up and he like sprays the audience with ex- like extermination stuff, the lights like come up for like 20 seconds or 30 seconds where spiders come down from the ceiling. There's red lighting everywhere. Obviously there's green smoke everywhere too. And that's when like you hear a bunch of screaming and like I think Flick's like, calm down guys. The animatronic Flick's like, calm down guys, calm down. It's going to be okay. But it's also like you're being attacked by everything. Should I say what this is about? It's basically really to our talking today. It's basically your friend the rat but about bugs but then Hopper comes in the kid and it's like, how dare you make these humans honorary bugs and they're evil and honestly hopper's got a point here unlike in the movie unlike in a bug's life he's got a point 
So then he attacks the audience, but then at the end, a chameleon character who is not in a Bug's Life or Toy Story. I gotta assume that was what I was more impressed by. It was like the detail on that chameleon model or lizard mm-hmm. model, whatever you want to call it. Basically, just eat Topper, and it's like, well, that's we gotta yeah. have a big musical number at the end. And then there's a big musical number, which weirdly in the video Mark watched was removed with royalty free music. Or you just gotta watch the dance moves while other music. Well, play. I looked up the song afterward. It's actually a pretty nice, big, fancy musical theater or showstopper number, and it's all sung by Bugs. And yep. then pretty much the show ends. Yep, this was really terrifying. Yeah, it seems like a very scary ride. I'm surprised that it would be like a seven eight thing. I mean, that's kind of the age where maybe you could like maybe see if you could handle it, but this seems like a ride that would be upsetting. Well, and I'm sure we talk about this when we talk about Bugs Land. The thing that's weird about this is that the rest of a Bugs Land, which is, um, let me clarify. So this is in two parks, right? This is in Animal Kingdom, which is where the original version is, where it's just a thing, right? It's just a just a ride. There's no nothing to go along with it. It's just like, oh, here's, like, it's like how Finding Nemo the musical is there. It's like, oh, there's the one Finding Nemo thing. And this is like, oh, it's the one Bugs Life thing. But then in California Adventure, it opens with, and I'm not going to get into it because I'm sure we talked about it or we'll talk about it, whatever time that's a bug's land and the thing about a bug's land is a bug's land is basically a kitty area of the park and then there's this <laughs> there's this crazy thing that's terrifying next mm-hmm. to it where it is yeah. like you know there's a bunch of kids my like my age my, when i'm there like seven year olds like my younger brother wrote it that's tough to be a bug and he was five when we went if i was seven so it was scary. Although I'm pretty sure a lot of the rides my brother rode when we went, like this type of thing is the type of thing mom puts him in his lap, her lap. So it's like he might freak out at the spiders coming down, but he's not going to be freaked out by his butt being punched by like ants crawling under him, type of thing. I guess I didn't hear much screaming in the video that I watched, but it yeah, if you seems watch the like the kind you can of hear thing. the screaming. <laughs> it's definitely yeah. There. <laughs> Everything is so it's like it's perfectly designed to trigger every like kid fear of like bugs and they're large and they're coming at you i had a thing when i was little like i saw some mars documentary at one of those giant imax or maybe it's not imax theaters but it's like when you're on a wall of seats and you're just kind of like feel like you're hanging over the movie and i i could not deal with this mars documentary because it was just like this it's just large and 3d and in your face all my, this is something where it's such a weird thing to talk about because we are talking around like the other episode. So I will hold my thought because I'm sure whatever thought I want to give in relation to the IMAX thing will come up when I'm talking about some of the Cars rides. So, mm. but I get that experience and I will say that there are other rides at Disneyland that I think are more close to that than what it's tough to be able to guess. This reminds me of when I went to Wisconsin Dells. <laughs> And we went on the first ever, this is an air quotes thing, because it definitely was not the first ever. It's like, first ever 4D water simulator Spongebob. And it was like, okay. It was basically like this, but with Spongebob, right? It, so it was just like, okay, who cares? Mm-hmm. It was not as good, because I think that's the key thing with Disney, is that it, you, may, you might be in the themes, you might not, but also they are the ones to do the theme portion of theme parks the best. Perhaps. Although I guess I've yeah. never been to Universal, so I can't really speak to that. I've never been to Harry Potter World. I, never I hear to. Harry Potter World is very well liked for the theme reasons. But so do you have a positive memory of Bugs Bug World? No, Bug, no I don't. I, no, I don't. This is this is a this is not a good Disneyland thing. This was a this scared me. I don't have a lot of memories of Disneyland, but this one was like scary and disturbing. But I will okay. also say that like if I remember right. This is where my mom was on this with us with Tim, my younger brother. And then after this, this is where she's like, all right, I'm going to take Tim somewhere else. And you guys can do the scarier stuff. Which also, you know, thinking about this trip now is so funny. Because it's like me and my older brother were the older kids there. But it's like we were seven and nine. <laughs> which I guess is, I guess, I don't know, that, that is like the perfect age to take your kids to Disneyland. Five, seven, and nine. But like, actually five, seven, and eight. Because my brother's birthday's in December. But, like, that's, like, the perfect age to take your kids to Disney. Because it's, like, especially Disneyland. Because Disney World has scarier stuff at it than Disneyland does. Especially at this time. So, it's, like, yeah. But 
Anyway, this was, I think, yeah. this was, like, the breaking point where Mom would be like, alright, we're splitting up. I'm taking the youngest one to some less scary shit. You know? <laughs> Very bizarre that Toy Story, which had some scares in it, like, I wonder what they thought the audience would be like to up the scare factor so significantly before Bugs Life. Because I kind of feel like all of the rides, I mean, like, compared to every other one that we watched, this seems like the most harrowing. And it's bizarre to me that there's not just a blanket G rating across all of the rides, you know? No, there's, um, because, well, okay, this actually, and I'm sure our guests for the Parks episode will be able to cover this better, but the big rivalry always with Disney is Universal, right? And Disney and Universal are a lot like Mario and Sonic. And that, that I mean, Mario, you know, or like, that, I think make, they're owned actually, by the a better same comparison. company. What? In that I think they're actually owned by the same company now. Mario and Sonic? Yeah. I think Sega no, is a part they, of Nintendo. No, they're not. They, they they have a good deal with them. But, like, they don't... They, you can get Sonic games on PS4. Or PS5. Whatever <laughs> PS we're on right now. Um, but my point is, actually, a better one to use as an example, really, because it's Disney, is Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny, right? Where Mickey might have been there first, but Bugs Bunny was, like, the rowdier one. And that's what Universal always was like. It was the more rowdy one. So it comes to a time where, you know, like, Disney, I think, is still doing well, but they're trying to chase Universal. So they're like, oh, what do we do? It's tough to be a bug. Sure. The real the real thing I always think is interesting, even though I haven't watched a defunct land on it, I think there is a defunct land on it, is the alien ride Disney had. Mm -hmm. the, are you aware of the alien ride Disney had at one point? No. So I'm looking up to get the uh, the name of it. Because I know they replaced it with a Stitch ride that was also really bad. Because I rode the Stitch ride when I was there at Disney World. Oh, yeah. It's called Air Alien Encounter Exter... This is so hard to pronounce out loud. Extra Terror... Terror Estrial. Alien Encounter. So it's not actually about Alien. It was built in 1994. Really opened in 95, you know. And then it closed in 2003. It was considered absolutely terrifying people originally it was pitched to be a part of alien but then it was like no it's rated r we can't have that um and i just remember hearing i've never read in it but i've always heard it's like absolutely scary and like yeah. everyone's like no way and they replaced it with the stitch ride which was also kind of scary but the thing that sucked about the stitch ride was like was a part of it i just remember stitch farted and it was just literally the most rancid smell ever and it's like i get it but also why would anyone want this? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm really not drawn to anything with, like, smell of vision I think that it's a terrible idea. I'm actually laughing just... looking at this, because I'm looking at the timeline of this ride, okay? So, Extra Terrestrial replaces Mission to Mars, which is another kind of serious motion simulator ride. That gets replaced with Stitch's Great Escape, which closes in 2018, which lasts late too long. And after that one, they're just like, Fuck it, we give up, we close. This is just we're gonna be able to meet Stitch. Like this is it's just where Stitch comes out to, to take pictures. We're not putting a ride here anymore. We're done with mm. that, and I kind of appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, and I'm also totally wrong, everyone. I looked it up. Sega's not owned by Nintendo. They're their own thing. They I just knew collaborate that. now. <laughs> well, I know, but I know maybe I don't want to fake news the audience. Yeah. But anyway. But, yeah, th there's a scary factor in Disney. I think this is definitely um the scariest ride we have from Disney Pixar. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe I'm wrong. There's some I haven't got to yet. But I think, basically, so the listeners know, Mark and I are kind of both halfway through looking at the rides for the ride episode at the time of recording. But we both have basically watched the ones the others haven't. But I can say right now, from what I've watched, there's nothing as, like, terrifying to a child is this yeah i don't so think fun. so either yeah and i even checked out the haunted mansion because i was like if there's one thing that i should watch to see if i would like it it should be that and i don't think that comes close to i just like i said earlier this seems to press every button that a child could have while the haunted mansion is more pretty i can say as a child and this is why i know i went in october was because they do this really annoying thing at Disney that I know people always complain about, where they overlay the Haunted Mansion with Nightmare Before Christmas shit. And the reason it's annoying is because they do it, they start it in October, and everyone's like, that's dumb, because I want to be there on Halloween riding the actual Haunted Mansion. Like, you know, like, do it from November to December, stop overlaying it so early. But then they overlay yeah. it early because, you know, 
they they want to be able to have it open for November, and it's like they have to close the ride a bit to the overlay. It's all you know, you, they, you, that makes sense. So it's like we got to yeah. do it in October because otherwise we have to close it in October to have it ready for November. And you're not gonna close the haunted mansion during Halloween, but yeah. Um, so when I went, it was the haunted man, uh, Night Before Christmas stuff, and that wasn't too scary. If I remember right, the scary stuff at Disney is California Screaming, which we will talk about in our ride episode, or we talked about in our ride episode. Which I think if anything else was scary at Disneyland as a child, because you know I went to Disney World when I was like twelve or thirteen. I went to Disneyland when I was like an actual kid, kid, you know, not like mm-hmm. a kid who's like trying to prove himself, just like a normal kid. The scariest thing at Disney World was meeting Buzz. <laughs> I was afraid he wouldn't like me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I also remember Space Mountain being terrifying as a child, but you can't really watch ride videos of Space Mountain because the reason that's scary is because you can't see anything. So like you just can't get the experience of it while watching a video of it i couldn't tell you i would have to i would have to watch every video for every ride that everyone has been on except for me to have the full experience i will say i do think the thing about scariness is because i think world has a lot more effort for that than land because california adventure was supposed to be this idea where it's like we're having scary shit here and it's like just kidding it's going to be fun california stuff and it's like okay So Disneyland is a lot more, whereas Epcot and Hollywood Studios, which Hollywood Studios is in Florida, um, those both have actual attempts at scary rides. The one ride I do want to ride at Disneyland, if I ever go back there, because I'm sure it's scary, and maybe you should watch this even though, actually, you should watch it as a good, like, idea. You should watch the Tower of Terror ride if you want a good, like, what a scary ride at Disney World is like. Um, But that's Hmm. at Disney World now. Disneyland is replaced with the Guardians ride, which I, is to believe... It's the same ride, it's just Guardians themed instead of Twilight Zone themed, because Disney's not mm-hmm. allowed to have Marvel themes in the parks in Florida because of deals that pre exist gotcha. their um, Marvel deal. But the Guardians ride, I've heard very good things about anyway. I would love to ride the Guardians ride. Um, actually, I think mm-hmm. if I remember right, I think World might have a Guardians ride too, it's just not the Tower of Terror, they just have a different ride. Um, because since the Guardians were not popular when they made their initial deal with Florida, they exist outside this realm where Disney can put them wherever they want and not worry about legal stuff because they're so new, like, as characters. Or, like, rather, they they were around in the 80s, but no one gave a shit about them until, like, 2007 in comics. So it's like, yeah. they can do whatever they want. But it's inf- gotcha. the, thing, the thing that frustrates me is that they can't make a Wakanda... Just because Black Panther is considered an Avenger primarily. I'm just like, that's so dumb. I I firmly believe that they should have made a Wakanda world instead of an Avengers campus. Mm-hmm. But You know what? I don't know. Part of me feels like you could have like a Wakanda section. I don't know if you need to like explore all of the avenues of a Wakanda world. Well, you know? I'm saying that... So, it's Avengers Campus. It's just like this warehouse, basically, where the Avengers walk around. You can meet a bunch of Avengers, which is cool. Because I always... They, I, one of the episodes we listened to his research, um, they mentioned that the you always see the heroes. They're, they're always coming around, which is cool that it's very packed. with Because unlike, you know, the rest of Disney World, where you have the... the the like creepy, <laughs> the cre- I, I, I've never liked the people in the, like, the big suits. They freak me out. But then you also have the face characters. And it's cool that at... I presume besides, like, maybe Rocket and Groot, I presume everyone in Avengers Campus is... Or, and the Hulk. I presume all of them are, like, face characters, right? hmm So I, I assume yeah. that's pretty fun. But what I would say is, my pitch for a, a Marvel thing would be you make a Wakanda and just have the story of the park be that the Avengers are visiting. So you can always have the Avengers there and just, like, put Avengers... Or, like, the Avengers are establishing an outpost in Wakanda. I know, like, it's bogus. Like, T'Challa would never be cool with that. But it's, like, it's a park. I think people would rather be in Wakanda than a warehouse, right? <laughs> it does, yeah. Well, if you put it that way, Wakanda versus the warehouse, then the choice is clear. Yeah, exactly. But I just think this is the kind of thing that maybe we talked about or maybe we didn't on the episode that may or may not exist yet, is I just think, like, you see... We should title the, the this episode thi- Schrodinger's episode. <laughs> <laughs> But it seems like people are paying for the theme, and the theme is my least favorite part of all of this. It's like you're taking these characters that I like from the movie, and then you're having people pretend to be them when I know that they're not. Or you have, like, bizarre, uh, deformed versions of them, like with Woody and Buzz and the 
like big headed right. people and they like don't I, talk. It's all like some like mirror darkly shit. I will where you can't like you're like removed from the thing you actually like in some way. I presume we will talk way. a lot about this in whatever up whenever that episode is, but my one response is, Mark, is that this is not for us. This is for seven year old Danny who was meeting Buzz Lightyear for the first time and was freaking out even if he was deformed. It doesn't matter if they look deformed. I mean, you just yeah. assume cartoon characters when they come to the real world look weird. It's just like, oh, okay, I guess they're visiting, you know? Oh, when I don't think that. But, all right. I think, Mark, you gotta actually... I don't wanna be like, you gotta actually go. But I'm sure you'll be getting that a lot also in our other episode. But, like, you can say the people who are just acting as them are just them. But it's like, when you're a kid, you're obviously gonna believe it's actually them. And then, if you're an adult, it's like, you, these people are very skilled in prop performers. Like, mm-hmm. they're highly... I'm, I'm, if you haven't seen it, I recommend you look up some compilations on YouTube of the Gaston. Because the Gaston guy at Disney is always really great. Like, he always has good bits. Um, I highly recommend that. But then there's also... Yeah, like, you know, I know you, they're good. I just, like, don't... I just... I there is just the like i can appreciate them as improv but i don't go to see the characters you know like i know that that is not what is happening it's someone playing gaston i mean i guess but again if you're a child it's just gaston and i mean or you're you're... me as a child and it's not gaston i think that's the issue too is it's like well all children are like this and it's like well no it's not (laughs) I guess. I don't know. As someone who works with kids, I I gotta say, I've never heard of a kid going to Disney World and coming back and going like, they didn't even have the real one. (laughs) You know? They're like, no, I met Stitch and the Princesses, right? That's what they say. They don't really go like, that wasn't the real one. But I don't really want to talk too much about this because I'm sure we'll get into it way more intensely and in way more detail in the rides episode. Mm -hmm. Um, But what about It's Tough to Be a Bug? I... It's basically You're from the Rat but with some cool effects. I didn't want to talk about, I said this to you earlier, I wanted to talk about the Q music that I wish I had time to look up beforehand. Did you see this? Did you ever look at this? Yeah, I read that the Q music that plays are versions of Broadway classics, like One and Beauty and the Beast, but they're bug-themed. They're changed somehow, but we didn't have time to like dig into it. But you basically I, you get the gist is... It's these Broadway classics, but they're all bug themed. And then they also have posters on the walls showing you the bugs that you'll meet during the show, but they're in things like genre movies where they're starring in it. Like they have a termite character in the show and they have a poster for a movie called The Termite Aider and stuff like that. I would love to listen to these. I should check YouTube afterwards to see if any of them exist and how long they are. Mm-hmm. I'm curious about specifically tonight. Mixed with Flight of the Bumblebee, which sounds interesting to me, like a remix of Tonight, Tonight. But with the Flight yeah. of the Bumblebee playing behind. I don't know how that mashup works. Should we talk about Leonardo? Um, No, I don't really have much more to say about the specific ride. I'll okay. also say there are maybe some caveats to what I was saying about like identifying with characters or not. I also just like... As I've said a billion times, I just didn't grow up with Disney and like Pixar characters and stuff like that. I think that I'm correct in that you're always you always have this double mind awareness about the character not being the character but it's also like i just this isn't stuff that i was into as a kid anyway no so more. i don't even ha- i don't even have like a buy into it mentality about that sort of thing i'm very curious of all this talk how we will eventually react when we get to the detour of the disney plus show that's titled pixar in real life that is um about it's a prank show where people just act as Pixar characters in real life and people react to it. What? Is that a real thing we're doing? That's a real thing where it's like, Miguel's playing music in the park and his grandma comes to scream at him. How will the people around him react? (laughs) And stuff like that. Oh, well, (laughs) probably they're not going to react or they're going to react strongly because things that happen in movies aren't real. So, there. I don't know, not to be, like, too negative about that. I'm sure there's something interesting about that, but I'm just... I haven't watched them, You just so. tell me that concept, and I'm like, ugh! You've done the same thing that I hate about these rides, is you've just... You've, like, skinned these characters, and then patched Bring their bodies onto people. this other... This, like, mechanical skeleton, and then they're like, look, another thing that we can sell you. And it's like, whatever. See, this is why, Mark, I gotta say... 
when we do our ride episode, I don't care what you do, you should just look up like either like Test Track, Soarin', one of the Disney, big Thunder Road, you should look up one of the Disney rides that isn't themed around a character, just so you have context on what these look like when they aren't based on IP. Because Disney has so many great rides, or Expedition Everest, that's actually a really good one because that one's recent. Um, recent isn't like it's 2004, mm-hmm. it's not like the ones I just listed where they're all like well, I'll check them out. park. But my point is, is like, these parks can do real magic without IP, too. But you're only watching the ones that are based off IP because that's what this show is about. And you have no context of what the ones are without IP. So I think you should just... I'm just saying, just for your own benefit of, like, having, like... Basically, what's the word for it? Like, a white balance? You know, like, how you have yeah. a white balance for... Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if there is a word for that, but that's that's probably a good way of putting it. But yeah. yeah. A white balance for the listeners who aren't super into film is what you do in film school. To, you put a white a sheet of paper in front of your camera so you can like be like okay so that's what white's supposed to look like so your color correction looks right anyway leonardo came out in 2009 (laughs) detour leonardo and it was directed by jim capabianco who made your friend the rat and he um, received a nomination for screenplay for ratatouille and he did the wally credits that's really what i think is his greatest achievement (laughs) those those credits though Yes. So, uh, Leonardo. I think this was all right. Um, it was pretty impressive reading about how it took him 10 years to make it. And like we said earlier, he set out to see if he could do this thing in an independent way. Um, so even after he was already involved with Pixar and things like that, I believe he also did some work on The Lion King. So he goes way back. And... I thought it was neat. Um, I don't. I don't really connect with it because I think in the end it kind of has a little more structured. It's, it's a bit more structured, but it still kind of has the vibes of the student short films that we watched, where it's just kind of like, oh, this is a simple story, and we get some gags, and then it ends. But it's kind of. I don't know. It's not really. It didn't, like, pull me in, and I think the story itself is a little bit, this is just thin. Yeah. Not much going on. So I pulled up the IMDb page, because I wanted to make see when this was released. It just says 2009, so we don't know when this actually came out. I know played, it's, the one review on it says, played at this festival I went to in June 2009, so I'm sure this was on the circuit for a bit. What I thought, okay, first off. I agree with you. I might be a little more cool on it than you, honestly, is that I think that it's cute, it's fun at points, but it's also just, I, I texted you, I'm like, Leonardo was kind of a struggle to get through, because <laughs> it's just, there's mm. really nothing there, the music is whatever, it's just kind of a simple, it's Leonardo da Vinci going for this sh- shit, you know? Yeah, I just, yeah, okay, so I felt a little bit different after i like read about the making of it but yeah that was my takeaway from just watching it i was like why did this end up in the moma what is the appeal oh, was it of in this, MoMA? this i actually did not know that was it in moma yeah th- well yeah i read a entry something about something from a curator of moma who saw this at the festival and people at the festival apparently loved it and they were trying to get autographs from Jim Capabianco and stuff like that. And she was like, oh, we have to have this in the MoMA. And I'm just like, man, I just, this, this just seems like any student film plus some interesting drawings. Well, uh, from like the interesting things are like the notes on the page and stuff from his children are included in the short as well. But they're not, I don't think they're incorporated in a, a like fluid way it seems kind of kind of chunkily pasted together and yeah i just i was surprised was... in the crowds of this how many animators were actually on this and mm-hmm. also they're all like this is a usually our detours are like you know it's the director that comes from pixar but this is like it's got ronnie del carmen and it's got pete stone working on it it's got like all these names at the studio that actually worked on this animating it and it's like mm-hmm. it's crazy that he got everyone on board for this little thing that definitely it's interesting to see all these Pixar animators working on something that's just traditional animation in 2009 you know 
yeah well i mean they can all do traditional animation they all you can see them all doing that in behind the scenes work yeah everything especially like when we see them design designing the scenes and stuff like that you can see them working it with things in two dimensions and he even writes about he writes about that on his blog detailing the making of the short like he had to have some reason for all of these different guys to be here and he just he just talks about like motivating a workforce and having a strong idea and planning it out it's a pretty interesting detail of the production of a short film but yeah i don't i'm not crazy about the end result I do want to talk, I will talk more about later on, but I wanted to mention this because I opened up on IMDb, is that it's, ins- <laughs> obviously this is not something that gets a lot of hits on IMDb, right? Like, this is a this is a short film that no one really knows exists. I looked it up on Letterboxd. It is already on Letterboxd. I don't need to add to Letterboxd. It has 17 views on Letterboxd. One of them, it only two reviews. One review is an actual review that's not in English, but the other review is um someone logging for the TV show Leonardo. Five stars. Love James Darcy. And it's like, okay. <laughs> um... Hmm. But the reason everything's up is the IMDb to, to twist to the letterbox game, but not really the IMDb game. If it exists, it says the two things that are similar to this are "Party Down" the TV show and "Knives Out," <laughs> which I'm just like, okay, so no one's clicking this. <laughs> so, yeah. like, the few people who have clicked this have looked up "Party Down" and "Knives Out." Like the two other people mm-hmm. in the world who have decided to look this up. So probably yeah. Jim Capabianco really likes "Party Down" and "Knives Out," would be my guess because. Sorry, who else would be checking this? <laughs> well, good for them. Yeah, but I, um, I can't. Yeah, I do think it gives me um a lot of Mr. Peabody and Sherman vibes, um, which I know we talked about recently also. But I mean, this yeah. just the original um Mr. Peabody and Sherman short, not the recent dream or recent ten year old DreamWorks movie. Um, like, uh-huh. you know, Rocky and Bullwinkle, but it's obviously way more spoonfully animated than that. And it's got some really cool drawing. I don't know. To me, this is one of those things where it's like, it's very long. It's kind of like meandering on like the, the flying stuff. The gags aren't really good. But then also then when it's all done, the reveal's just like, oh, then he goes on to paint the Mona Lisa. And it's just like, okay, yeah. cool. You do. And then like, the longest the credit Lisa. sequence ever begins. What? It just has a really long and slow credit sequence, which I thought was bizarre. They gotta pad that run time up. Make yeah. it long and That's good. That's the thing. This whole short is, like, so much padding. Yeah. It reminds me of my uh, Toy Story point that I always make, where it's like, yeah, Snow White was the first animated film, but so is Toy Story. The difference is Toy Story is ten minutes longer than Snow White, but feels an hour shorter. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's what this short is. Is like, I, was it really worth getting it to ten minutes? If it's this, I will say I am curious about the. Uh, have you looked up the inventor at all? Like the art, the art style of it. So, the director of this has been working no. on a film called a feature version of this adaptation of this called The Inventor, um, which actually premieres next month at Anarchy, which is a big the big animation fest. Um, Nimona is going to premiere there. The the new Kraken movie is going to premiere there, and the Spider Verse short film about miles having a panic attack to join puss in boots and Ma- uh and uh mario is also premiering there so um mm. but no this premier that does what's crazy to me it's like this i looked it up and it's like oh this has been developing for a while holy shit it's premiering next month what a time for us to be talking about this um i hope it's good it's one of those things where it's like if you work on something for so long you, you really hope it turns out okay because it's like why why would you want it but also, like, did you have you looked at the voice cast for this movie? No, I don't. I don't know anything about it. The movie has the main three characters are being played by Stephen Fry, which, okay, so that, that that's something that proves it's an indie movie. To me, is that if you're leading to Stephen Fry, okay, it's indie, got it. But then the other ones are Marion Cotillard, Daisy Ridley, and Matt Berry. Matt Berry's playing the Pope, which is pretty exciting. I feel like. Wow. It's also got a lot of really good people involved with it. Tom Moore is involved with it as an animation consultant. Do you know who Tom Moore is? No. Tom Moore is the guy at Cartoon Saloon who made Wolf Walker, Secret of Cows, Song of the Sea. He's... Oh, cool. Yeah, he's great. I love him. Um, I remember he, he said my favorite response to the AI art when it really started kicking off was someone is like, can someone make an AI art that looks like Tom Moore? And he just, I don't remember what he was like, please don't. 
or something like that. It wasn't like that. He was. It was way more harsh than that. I don't know if he said. I'm not even like fuck off. I don't want to put that word, those words in his mouth. But he seemed very like, damn. Like he seemed to be like, no, don't do this. And why are you tagging me in this? I don't want mm-hmm. this to happen. Don't make AI art that looks like my shit. But yeah. no, they played 25 minutes of it last year at Anarchy, and this year they're premiering it at Anarchy, which is a French animation festival. Cool. Very cool that it's premiering. It hasn't sold yet to a distributor in America. I assume, it seems like a Netflix thing, you know, like something Netflix will just pick up. But yeah, it's pretty exciting. This is finally coming out. It costs $10 million. So, and obviously it will eventually be a detour we cover because it's by this director. But yeah, mm. he's apparently been... Okay, so it was finally greenlit in 2018. Do you have other thoughts about Leonardo? I don't... It reminds me of also... I don't know if you ever watched those growing up. Um... Well, maybe it's the only one is Beauty and the Beast, but when Beauty and the Beast came out on DVD, like the special edition, because it was the first DVD. Well, actually, so there's this weird trend in the early 2000s where Disney re-released both Beauty and the Beast and Lion King as special editions where they added the song in, where it completely messed with the flow of the movie entirely. I mean, maybe I wanted to point out, so in Beauty and the Beast, they added Human again, which is like, you know, the song from the Broadway show too, but it was also originally written for the movie. But then mm-hmm. for The Lion King, they added Morning Report, which is a song that Julie Taymor decided not to include in the stage show because it completely messed with the pacing. Of a, and if it messes with the pacing of a two and a half hour long stage show, the idea is it's obviously going to throw off a 90 minute movie, right? Um, mm-hmm. It's not that good of a song. Yeah. But anyway, the Beauty and the Beast special edition DVD, you can watch three versions. You can watch the theatrical cut, you can watch the version of Human Again, which everyone like clicked once and it was like, no, I'd rather than that. Not because like, the way human again is slotted, it's like right in between something there, and they leave after something there. It cuts back to Gaston and Lafu like having a scene where they set up something for the third act, and then it cuts right to Beauty and the Beast, right the song number. So it's like there are already two mm-hmm. songs pretty close to each other with something in the middle just to separate them. The idea of throwing human again either right, I don't remember if it's right before Beauty and the Beast or right after something there. It's just like. This movie's, like, you can't have this much song there. But anyway, they had the special edition, they had the theatrical cut, and they had something that was called the Work in Progress Edition. I want to get this right. Beauty and the Beast. So, Little Mermaid, you know, brought back Disney, right? From the grave. Yeah. But Beauty and the Beast is what cemented it, because, you know, it gets that Best Picture nomination. It's what everyone was saying. I remember the main critic thing I always read about it was, like, at the time, we were like, this is the best Broadway musical this year, and you could see it as a cartoon. Which is why, obviously, they adapted it to Broadway afterwards, because it was like, that was the type of grades, the reviews it got. But, so, the movie premieres in America, finished in November 13th, 1991. However, Disney is so proud of this movie, and for good reason, Beauty and the Beast is one of the greatest anime, American animated movies of all time. They screen it at the New York Film Festival in September 29th, 1991, so about a month and a half before the film is done. The other 30%, 30, 70% of the movie is complete. The other 30% is storyboards and pencil tests that make up, like, for example, I remember very specifically the big Beauty and the Beast number in that it's like there's CGI around them and it's just them in black and white kind of dancing, like, as an, not as an animatic, but like you can see the line work on them. Anyway, all this to say is that this is what that reminds me of, is the art style reminds me a lot of the work in progress Beauty and the Beast. Which I think oh, yeah. is still something really cool. I would love to see more of, even though I understand the only reason it exists was because, you know, they actually played it at a festival, right? So, Well, that's cool. I, yeah, I don't really have much of a memory of Beauty and the Beast as a film experience, because I think I've only seen the whole thing, like, once or twice. Dude, I do you always ask it. me, like, what should I watch after this? You should watch Beauty and the Beast. That's a movie that I remember... I was in the state show in high, like high school, and you know when you're in a show, you fucking hate it after a while, right? And then I rewatched mm-hmm. it in college, and I was like, because no, you know when you're in, in it, you're kind of like, this is overrated, blah, blah blah. Like I don't get why this Lion King is so much better, and I do still think the Lion King is better. But then like you watch it again, like a couple years later, away from the material, and you're like, oh no, like it totally makes sense why this is like revolutionary to everyone. And everyone was blown away by it. It's just a really well done fantasy love story. Um, with really well, right. good music. I'll go check that out. Yeah, um, I definitely recommend but... it. It's on Disney Plus. In case you're unaware. Oh my gosh! <laughs> in we... case you're unaware that one of Disney's most iconic movies is on Disney Plus. <laughs> yeah, 
Um, well, we should probably wrap it up because yeah. we got well, stuff going on. We got some crazy technical but... difficulties this episode. We don't even know when this episode is. Where is this world? Anyway, what should we give yes. these things? I am going to give it... You know, we both said that these films felt like they might were kind of like lacking something. Or in the Bugs Life case, it was just so over-the-top scary. It was like, holy cow, crazy stuff. So what I am going to give both of these films... Here's my thing. When I watched Leonardo, I was in the kitchen eating dinner and half watching uh, The Wire, which my roommate is re-watching, and that really enhanced my experience with Leonardo. I felt like that really satisfied me in places where Leonardo did not. So just to address address the holes in these, I want to give both of these films a Disney Plus membership so that you can have Beauty and the Beast on in the background while you're watching these movies and then you have like a full delightful experience and if you don't get everything you want out of the leonardo or if there's a scene that's too scary in the bug bug show watch beauty and the beast anyway i'm so tired danny i'll give it's tough to be a bug a mandatory international re-release in all the 40x theaters where everyone must go and be traumatized much like i give wally Whereas I'm like, well, it's like, we must pass this down to the next generation so they know what greatness is. For this, I'm like, they must know trauma. So that's what it's tough to be a buck, guess. Um, mm. For Leonardo, um, I will give it, this is very specific, and we'll date the episode, which is fine, because we always date our episodes of talking about current things, is, you know, I'm still currently on my Guardians of the Galaxy 3 obsessed kick, and... I would like to give it a better soundtrack so I can be more engaged in the coolest scene in Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Because, um, like, every Guardians of the Galaxy movie, there's, like, you know, the opening song that everyone knows, and then there's, like, one set piece set to a song that everyone knows. And in Guardians 3, the big set piece is set to No Sleep from Brooklyn Till Brooklyn. And uh, it's really great. It's a really badass scene, actually. Like, it's by far, like, it's a wonder where it's... I feel like wonders are getting very annoying in this one. Like, okay, they can still be good. Um, anyway, I want to set, I'm going to give Leonardo no sleep till Brooklyn. <laughs> so you can watch it with some, and jam out while you're watching it. <laughs> That's right. basically it. All right. <laughs> what are we doing next time? It is a big one next time, I think. Yes, presumably, if the rides up doesn't get mixed up, next time we'll be talking about Toy Story 3. It's a very big one. I'm bringing on my high school best friend. We'll be in the same room together talking about it, which is really exciting, too. We'll make Mark feel left out. I'll be like, hey, guys, I'm here. I'm here. Let me talk. <laughs> but, yeah, You'll it's both be able be... to share a secure internet connection. I'll have mine breaking over here. I hope she has a secure internet connection. <laughs> oh, no. I assume she does. She, she watches Netflix. Anyway. Yeah, that's, that's it. Toy Story 3 next time. Look, right. Yes. Looking for the ocean. It's produced by me. I'm Mark Young. And the guy on the other end of my Zoom, that's Danny Vincent. It's produced by him, too. The show is edited by the other guy on my Discord. Get it right, punk. Mark Young. I, wow, you're right. I don't even know what I'm looking at anymore. Um, our artwork was done by Sarah Knopf, who is not here with us right now. But I just enjoyed her on the Snub Club You're talking okay. about the Charlotte. You really should never just leave stopping at like, unfortunately, it's no longer here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you can follow us on social media at Facebook at Looking for the Ocean, Instagram at Looking for the Ocean Pod, Twitter at Pixar Journey, and at our website, Looking for the Ocean, Pixar.podbean.com. I'm on markyoungperformer.com. That's my like personal work website. And I'm also on M Young Insta, which is an Instagram account where I post other things. Nice. You can follow me, Danny, um, at Letterbox. Sorry, at Blankman's on Letterbox, where if you look at my MCU ranked list, it finally has a new top film. Crazy, right? It's ridiculous. How is it ridiculous? I saw the movie twice. Now I can feel I didn't just immediately put it there. <laughs> I don't know. It seems like the world is against me.
What? But that I like the Guardians of the Galaxy you. movie? Ooh, how dare Danny no, like a Guardians? It's no surprise. <laughs> it's just the I, I if they're over too, this is never gonna like swing my way. So I just have to accept it. It's okay. The MCU is over now. We never need to pay attention to it again. Um, <laughs> you can listen to my other podcast. Is that a promise? Okay, very briefly, and now I'll finish our wrap up. I was Jesus watching... Christ. Well, no, but you asked. You're asking. <laughs> How am I not supposed to answer? The one thing I was like, you know, before last week, I was like, you know, I'm actually looking forward to seeing this. Uh, if it's good, that um, Nick Fury show that's coming out, like it's being showrun by the Mr. Robot guy. Not, not the Mr. Robot guy, but a Mr. Robot guy. And maybe, like, it, I think it looks good. And then after I saw Guardians 3, I'm like, no, you know, it feels that that's it. That's, I'm done. Like, these, these are never going to hit this level again. These movies never hit these levels except when the Guardians movies existed for me. So, like, why even bother continuing? This is like an ending. Like, it's okay to move on from things. It's okay to put away things. Well, okay. I hold up to it. We'll see. But I just don't feel rushed watching these Disney Plus shows and any of the upcoming movies. Also, except for maybe Deadpool. Maybe I'll see Deadpool 3. I will give that one a pass. But anyway. Listen to the Snub Club. We talk about movies that have the most Oscar noms and no wins. Listen to the Snub Club. You know what else is an ending?